All right, let's get this party started. Um, hi, my name is Eva Galperin, and I'm a global policy analyst for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, how many of you here don't know what EFF is? Oh, no hands. Oh, one, one, okay. So, for the sake of the one person in the audience who does not know what the Electronic Frontier Foundation is, uh, we are a nonprofit made up of lawyers, technologists, and activists, making sure uh, that when you go online, your rights come with you. So, as a member of EFF's international team, my beat is the entire world outside of the United States, which is a lot. For the last several years, my focus has been on privacy, security, and free expression for vulnerable populations. Often this means activists and journalists, especially in countries where independent journalism is essentially an act of dissent. But this also includes minorities, people with unpopular opinions and affiliations. I'm also a member of the Tech Advisory Board of the Freedom of Press Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting and defending public interest journalism, both inside and outside of the United States. So the opening keynote is supposed to set the tone for the rest of the conference. So to kick this conference off, I'm gonna lay down a challenge. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work I've been doing since 2012, why I think it's important and its impact that it's had on companies, governments, and populations that have been the focus of targeted surveillance. And while I'm talking, I challenge you to think about the research you're going to do in the next year. Face it, that's probably what you're gonna be thinking about anyway. So, uh, before I begin, I want to I want to get one thing straight. I am not a reverser. I am probably the only person in this room that is not a reverser. But I have spent the last several years working with reversers, and I think that you have a set of skills that can be very useful to the populations that I'm trying to help. So, you could be heroes. No, really, big damn heroes. Me, I'm a little bit more like this. Um, I was gonna uh, bring my EFF cape, but I left it up in my hotel room. I figured it would be a little bit much. So in the beginning, there were kittens. I have repeatedly promised all over the internet that my uh, slideshow would be made up almost entirely of cats. This is not true. Uh, it is, I think, nearly 30% cats. So, starting with cats, uh, Ethan Zuckerman, who is the director of the MIT Center for Civic Media, once postulated that most people are not interested in activism, which is true, but mainly use the internet for surfing porn and lol cats. He once said that sufficiently usable read-write platforms will attract both porn and activists. He then goes on to stipulate that this subsequently makes activists more immune to reprisals by governments than if they were using dedicated activism platforms because messing with people's cute cats and porn would produce a far greater outcry than shutting down obscure activist resources. The tools that are developed for these activities, like Facebook, Twitter, Blogger, and such, are nevertheless very useful to social movement activists who lack the resources to develop dedicated tools themselves. Activists are an especially vulnerable population you see a turtle turned over on its back, why are you not helping? They often express unpopular opinions, belong to minority groups, and make powerful enemies. Activists are viewed with suspicion, if not outright hostility, by governments. They may be subject to legal action or government surveillance. In certain regimes, the very act of opposing the government or speaking out against it is illegal. Some governments may try to obtain information about users on these platforms by serving companies with court orders. But in states where the company does not have offices, servers, or employees, the government has no jurisdiction, and governments may resort to other methods. And that's where things get interesting. This brings us to Syria. So, for the last three years, Syria has been embroiled in an increasingly violent conflict between the authoritarian Assad regime and a variety of opposition forces, most recently ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. The largest ISP in the country, STE, is government controlled. And for much of the conflict, the Syrian government has had control over the country's entire internet infrastructure. The stakes are unusually high. When most users have their accounts compromised, the most they have to worry about is identity theft or fraud. And other parts of the country, still controlled by the Assad regime, 
Compromised users fear indefinite detention by security forces. In July of 2012, Human Rights Watch reported widespread use of torture and ill treatment throughout the 27 detention facilities run by Syrian intelligence agencies. Syrians living in regions controlled by the opposition fear for their friends, relatives, and contacts living in regions controlled by the Assad regime. In February of 2011, near the beginning of the conflict, the Assad regime lifted its long-standing ban on Facebook. At the time, some Western observers considered this to be a sign of liberalization. Assad had sort of developed this reputation as the father of the Syrian internet. Uh, Syrian users flocked to Facebook eager to share photos of cats, though not pornography because that's banned under Facebook's terms of service, and speak out against the government. But as it turns out, unblocking Facebook was not a sign of the Assad regime's liberalization. It was a trap. No sooner did Syrians start flooding Facebook than the Syrian government launched a man-in-the-middle attack against the secure version of this site. Facebook did not use HTTPS default at the time, though to be fair, very few other services did. The attack was not very sophisticated. The certificate was invalid in users' browsers and triggered a security warning. But because users see these warnings for operational reasons that have nothing to do with man-in-the-middle attacks, they sometimes click through them re reflexively. Attacks do not have to be sophisticated to be effective, which is a theme we will come back to a few times over the course of this talk. You can see the forged certificate here. The attack didn't last long, but it turned out to be just one of a series of campaigns in which pro-Syrian government actors struggled to gain access to activists' communications. At the end of 2010, a group of activists providing technical support to the uprisings were arrested. One of their number, who had remained unimprisoned, received a Skype message a couple days later from the account of one of his captured friends. This message advised him to install a useful tool which would enable him to disguise his online identity from the regime's surveillance. This is where I use the it's a trap slide again. Unthinkingly, he installed this software. He realized upon reflection that his friend was in jail and that the nature of the Skype communication was highly suspicious. He reached to, uh, out to external agencies for aid. Analysis of his machine revealed that he had been infected with a remote access tool, uh, which provided significant capability for the surveillance of victims. It allowed for the logging of keystrokes, a streaming remote view of his desktop, the ability to watch through his webcam and listen to him through his microphone, as well as the ability to execute arbitrary programs. In addition to this particular Trojan, the machine was found to have been twice previously compromised several weeks before by the same actors. Analysis of the computer in this malware continued through January, and on February 17th, the results of this, at least in limited form, were made public in a CNN article. The article announced that computer spyware is the newest weapon in the Syrian conflict, and discussed the widespread hijacking of activist accounts and credentials, as well as the targeting of dissidents. Since this article, I have worked with a group of activists and technologists to track multiple persistent campaigns targeting opponents to the current regime in Syria. Their preferred methods involve targeting dissidents via the Skype accounts of compromised friends as well as targeting them through social networks used to organize the revolution. Facebook, a platform which was banned in Syria until February of 2011, has many pro-revolution forums and profiles of prominent members of the Syrian opposition. In early April, the Facebook page of Burhan Golian, a professor at the Sorbonne in Paris, and at the time the leader of the Syrian opposition transnational council, was hit with a phishing attack. This attack led his almost 6,000 friends and any visitors uh, to his page to the following website. This website is obviously designed to look as if it is affiliated with Facebook and offers a download under the words Facebook security. The download is unsurprisingly malicious software with keylogging functionality. The malware was hosted on this that was hosted on this compromised site was found to be hosting multiple Facebook phishing campaigns by the same actors, such as this one, and this one. While this particular campaign is noteworthy due to the compromise of Burhan Gulian and his importance to the Syrian revolution, there have been many such campaigns hosted on hacked websites that have been documented over the last few years. While we've seen a steady stream of Facebook phishing attacks, we've also seen attacks on Skype and YouTube and other online sources. In a campaign that was detected in 2012 by Syrian activists, a fake UN website which offers a voting poll asking if you believe that the Syrian regime is guilty of war crimes. 
If you click yes, you are redirected to a page which informs you that you'll need to log in with your Gmail, Yahoo, Skype, or Windows live credentials in order to participate. So I, I don't know if any of you remember the alleged suicide bombing of three senior military officials in Damascus. Probably not. It was a while ago. Um, but this campaign came out a few days later. Uh, emails were sent to Syrian pro-revolution mailing lists alleging that the site seen here contained the final phone call of the Minister of Defense to his wife. It's been made to look like a Skype site, and when you click on his picture, it asks you for your Skype credentials. Topical social engineering has been a feature of these campaigns. We've seen pro-Assad actors seeding pro-revolutionary forums on Facebook with these types of messages since 2011. This says, Urgent and critical video leaked by security forces and thugs. The revenge of Assad's thugs against the free men and women of Baba Amr in captivity, taking turns raping one of the women in captivity by Assad's dogs. Please spread this. Clicking the link led you to the fraudulent YouTube site. Google Translate, not that great with Arabic. So another notable feature of the Syrian revolution has been its use of YouTube. There have been a lot of grisly and distressing videos posted from the conflict detailing the ongoing violence occurring in Homs, Hama, and other cities. The ability to display to the world the conflict occurring in a country where foreign reporting is largely banned has been extremely important. As you can see, this is a somewhat accurate mock-up of some of the pro-revolution Syrian channels that have spread up over the course of the uprising. The major difference is that this site was hosted on the server of a hacked British hosting company. On visiting the malicious website, users would be asked for their credentials in order to post comments, and attempts to view videos would inform the users that they were required to upgrade their Flash software. Naturally, the Flash installer was malicious and installed the surveillance malware mentioned earlier, allowing remote listening and viewing of their activities via their computers. This campaign featured malware which, was, which used the right to left override trick, which you may remember from the Mahdi malware. Uh, to masquerade as revolutionary plans for the formation of a high council after the revolution, which sounds a little bit redundant. Naturally, these documents installed the remote access toolkit. However, they also displayed documents to the user that, was pur that were purportedly intriguing and likely to be passed around by activists interested in their veracity. Another campaign by the same actors pretended to be a zero-hour plan for the city of Aleppo. The purported documents installed a Trojan. However, they were also... They also provided extensive documentation likely to be distributed by dissidents among their networks. It's not only been political events that have been used for social engineering. Skype is used by activists who distrust the country's telecommunications infrastructure. Please refrain from rolling your eyes. So this is a campaign that began uh, November 21st in 2012 shortly before the three-day internet blackout in Syria. Syria has suffered repeated internet blackouts over the last three years. It was spread over Skype messages from compromised accounts, which were awfully highly interactive conversations urging friends and contacts to open a PDF containing a list of financiers who were wanted by the Syrian regime. A similar campaign featuring a shorter and slightly different list began immediately after the end of the internet blackout on December 1st. In January 2013, Symantec reported on a new campaign of malware that had been spread using email purporting to be from Sheikh Adnan al-Arur, a prominent opposition figure. The email contains a zip attachment which opens this document and covertly installs a remote access tool called Extreme Rat. Some campaigns don't appear to be overtly political at first. Instead, they play on the fears that Syrians have about their privacy and security. After a series of reports that Skype leaked your IP and, by extension, allowed the tracking of your physical location, uh, we saw this attack. Playing on the concern of dissidents, the same actors began distributing Skype encryption software, which would allegedly alleviate this problem. If you are not a native English speaker, you might find this more convincing. If you are a native English speaker, you might notice that they have misspelled encryption. Notice that the software does not actually encrypt any phone calls. In addition to displaying a GUI and tragically abusing the Comic Sans font, this installs the same surveillance malware discussed earlier. A similar campaign plays into users' concerns about protecting their security by offering a fake security tool called Anti-Hacker, which promises to provide auto-protect and auto-detect and security and quick scan and analyzing. Again, very convincing to people who are not 
fluent in English. Unsurprisingly, much of the fake Skype, and, uh, much like the fake Skype encryption tool, this doesn't protect you against anything, but it does facilitate the installation of a remote surveillance backdoor. The anti-hacker tool even had its own Facebook page, which you can see here. The first post reads, does HTTPS really improve security compared to HTTP? How will we know we have complete internet security on, the, on our devices? And links to the tool. As you can see, the intensity of the campaign sometimes tracks events on the ground. But links between the intensity of malware campaigns and events on the ground are not always clear. In June of 2013, Citizen Lab reported on a series of fresh targeted attacks, including uh, free Freegate proxy software. In late 2013, we saw malware campaigns resume. Cyber Arabs, an Arabic language digital security project of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, first announced this attack on September 14th, warning of a malicious download posted to the pro-opposition Revolution Youth Coalition on the Syrian Coast Facebook group. Visitors to the site on that date saw a post and a picture that encouraged them to click on a download link. The text here translates as, important, the truth about killing Abu Basir al-Dakani has been revealed, using photos and videos and explanation of how Abu Basir, the battalion leader, was killed. This information would be of interest to many in this conflict. Abu Basir al-Dakani, al the nom de guerre of Kamal Hamami, was a well-known commander in the Free Syrian Army who was killed at a checkpoint in July of 2013, reportedly by elements of the Islamic State of Iraq and, and the Levant, ISIS. The malware came at a time of increasing concern among the more secular opposition elements over the recent successes of groups like ISIS. The text encourages the potential victim to click on a video related to the conflict. It appears that the Facebook group had been hijacked by the, by the attackers. Comments by Facebook users who attempted to alert their peers about the potential dangers of downloading this video were removed by the administrator in an ongoing basis. Clicking on the link downloads an executable which was first submitted to Virus Total on September 14th, 2013. This remote access tool is known as Bladakindi, or NJRAT. Uh, earlier this year, the tool was identified in the targeting of government agencies in the Middle East, but this appears to be the first time it's been identified in Syria. This attack was first seen in an email sent to an NGO administrator on October 7th with the subject, Serious Video, it shows the malice of al-Assad's military. The sender's email address suggests connections to the Jabhat al-Nusra front. The body of the message reads, leaked and very, very, very serious footage. See what happens to a civilian and what the civilian said, followed by a link to the video. The URL in the email expands into a zip file. The zip archive contains an executable. Executing this file displays an extremely graphic and disturbing video of a man having his throat cut with a knife and bleeding to death. This was a very, very bad day of malware analysis. And the executable covertly drops a file which we identified as Extreme Rat, a remote access tool we've seen frequently used in Syrian campaigns. And finally, not everything that looks like Syrian malware really is Syrian malware. Meanwhile, a new Mac OS, S OS X OS X, the people from Apple always make fun of me for saying OS X, uh, was found on VirusTotal and was reported by Intego on September 17, 2013 in a post called New Mac Trojan Discovered Related to Syria. The report generated considerable media attention and speculation about possible links between this attack and the Syrian Electronic Army. The Syrian Electronic Army went so far as to publicly deny responsibility. We find no linkages between this Trojan and the malware groups that we have analyzed. The malware was distributed disguised as this picture of people kissing. It is worth noting the previous malware campaigns associated with Syria that we've reported on have used sophisticated social engineering to tempt users into downloading their applications, using images and messages relating to the Syrian conflict, or disguising the malware as a security tool. The image above does not fall into either of these categories. The couple of kissing is relatively innocuous. It's also unusual to see an OS X Trojan targeted at this population, which is made up almost entirely of Windows users. Why the attacker would want to associate their malware with the Syrian Electronic Army is unclear, but the preponderance of evidence appears to suggest that this operation is unrelated to the campaigns we've been tracking since 2011. Um, here we have uh, sort of the, one of the two groups 
uh, whose campaigns we have been tracking. We call them ALOSH 66 because those are the sorts of domains that they use over and over and over again. You can see the domains that they use, their distinguishing feature, and uh, the rats that they favor, which are all very cheap. Here is a list of some of the attacks which uh, we have associated them with. The .28 uh, gang, whose uh, repeated distinguishing feature is the use of exactly the same command and control IP over and over and over again, thus making it really easy to track their campaigns. Uh, they uh, also are very fond of using both Dark Comet and Extreme Rat. Here are the campaigns we've associated with them. So, what did all that research accomplish? Syrians are growing more aware of the danger these campaigns pose to their security and the security of their friends and loved ones. Taimur Karim is a Syrian anti-government activist who was captured and tortured by the Syrian police. Despite not revealing information under interrogation, his computer had already told all. He was confronted with transcripts of his Skype conversations, chat logs, and more. As he described it, my computer was arrested before me. On Facebook, the Union of Free Students in Syria group started an album of students holding up signs warning against phishing attacks and malware with messages such as, Assad supporters are sending dangerous files with hacked accounts. Check with your friends before opening an attachment. This is Jean-Pierre Lesseur, who goes by the name Dark, Cor Dark Coder SC. He is 25 years old and lives in France. He is the developer behind the free Dark Comet remote access tool, which was used so widely by the pro-Syrian government actors that it became synonymous with Syrian malware. In July of 2012, Lesseur announced that he was stopping development of the tool because of its quote-unquote misuse. He vowed to spend his time working on more legitimate remote access tools like VNC, which are not classified as malware. Dark Comet is no longer available for downloading, but older versions of the software are still in circulation. At a similar time, though, not necessarily because of this, we've seen groups in Syria move to the use of Black Shades Rat and NJ Rat. Since the demise of Dark Comet, we've seen multiple variants of Black Shades in a row, but just because Dark Comet is no longer supported doesn't mean it's no longer used by pro-Syrian regime actors. We have seen campaigns using Dark Comet as recently as a campaign da dating back to the end of 2012, offering a list of names of some financiers in Syria and abroad who, wanted to, who are wanted by the Syrian regime. These are cheap tools. Black Shades cost somewhere between 50 and 100 bucks. The website advertises Black Shades as, quote unquote, an efficient way of turning your computer into a surveillance slash spy device or to spy on a specific system. When the FBI arrested more than 100 people as part of a global operation against people who had purchased and used Black Shades Rat, nearly every article mentioned that it had been used by pro-Assad actors against Syrians. Other countries use expensive be bespoke surveillance tools such as FinSpy and uh, hacking teams RCS, made by European-based Gamma International, or uh, Milan-based hacking team, but the Syrian campaigns have been characterized by its use of cheap and free tools. Why? It's not money. 250 to 500K is pretty much dictator pocket change. Assad probably has half a million stuffed between his couch cushions. The answer is sanctions. The US and the EU have trade sanctions against selling surveillance tech to Syria, also to Iran and North Korea, so they've grown their own. But the same sanctions that prevent Western companies from selling this tech to Syria also prevent Syrians from being able to buy or download the tools they need to protect themselves, including antivirus software and automated security updates. Syrians cannot make purchases from Apple's App Store or Google Play. Syrians have gotten used to downloading sketchy software from strange sources, which is what makes the malware campaign advertising security software so effective, even when they clearly look suspicious to us. And this is why education is so important in the Syrian context. Syrians are not the only population feeling, uh, feeling targeted surveillance by pro-government actors. For the last several years, the communist government of Vietnam has used malware and rats to spy on journalists, activists, dissidents, and bloggers, while it cracks down on dissent. Vietnam's internet spying campaigns date back to at least March 2010, when engineers at Google discovered malware broadly targeting Vietnamese computer users. The infected machines were used to spy on their owners, as well as participating in DDoS attacks against dissident websites. The Vietnamese government has cracked down sharply on anti-government bloggers who represent the country's only independent press. It is currently holding 18 bloggers and journalists, 14 from a year earlier, according to a report issued by the Committee to Protect Journalists in 2013. 
EFF has written extensively about the worsening situation for bloggers in Vietnam, criticizing Vietnam's internet censorship legislation and supporting campaigns for freeing high-profile bloggers such as Le Quoc Quan, a human rights lawyer, democracy activist, and a prominent Catholic blogger who has been imprisoned under harsh conditions for more than a year now. And Du K, uh, also uh, whose real name is Nguyen Van Hai. Uh, he is a Vietnamese blogger who has been prosecuted by the government of Vietnam for tax evasion and disseminating anti-state information and materials. In December, on December 20th, 2013, two EFF staffers, one of which was myself, uh, received an email from Andrew Oxfam inviting them to an Asia conference and inviting them to click on a pair of links which were supposed to contain information about the conference and the, and the invitation itself. There is no easier way to find malware than to have the state send it to you. These links were especially suspicious because they were not hosted on Oxfam's domain, but instead directed the invitee to a page hosted by, on Google Drive, seen below. In addition, this email contained two attachments purporting to be invitations to the conference. This targeting is especially interesting because it demonstrates some understanding of what motivates activists. Just as journalists are tempted to open documents promising tales of scandal, and Syrian opposition supporters are tempted to open documents pertaining to abuses by the Assad regime, human rights activists are interested in invitations to conferences. For greater verisimilitude, the attacker should have included an offer to pay for flights and hotels. The detection rate for this malware is very low. Using virus total, we see that only one antivirus vendor out of a possible 47 detect was detecting this at the beginning of January 2014. Some malware was also sent to, the, to an associated press reporter um, masquerading as a human rights watch paper. In this attack, clicking on the link in the email takes the user to, the malici to a malicious HTML application. Uh, eventually, this installs a rat which exfiltrates the data to a domain pointing to an IP that has been used as the command and control server for various Vietnamese-related malware. I have not just cats, but also doges. In February of 2013, a Vietnamese blogger and mathematics professor received an email. As with the EFF and AP attacks, the HTML application contains an encoded executable and a document. A prominent Vietnamese pro-democracy blogger living in California was successfully targeted by this attack, which led to the compromise of her blog and the invasion of her private life. The group behind these attacks appears to have been operating since 2009, but has been very active in the targeting of Vietnamese dissidents, people writing on Vietnam, and the Vietnamese diaspora. This appears to be the work of a group commonly known as Sing Tu Lin. And while it has been anecdotally claimed to be the work of Chinese actors, it seems more likely to be the work of Vietnamese targeting Vietnamese. Last of all, I'm going to talk about a case that goes beyond user awareness. I like this one because it's a story about a collaboration between activists, technologists, and lawyers, and also because it's about EFF doing what it does best, filing lawsuits. In late 2012, I was contacted by a security researcher who had found a sample of FinFisher spyware in Ethiopia that used photos of members of an Ethiopian democratic opposition group called Ginbot7 as part of their targeting. At this time, we were already aware that FinFisher had a command and control server in Ethiopia. The makers of the surveillance spyware claim that they sell only to governments and law enforcement. The researcher asked me if I knew anyone from that opposition group, which I did not, and I spent the next three months trying to get somebody from this group to talk to me. They were understandably cautious. In spite of their nonviolent nature, in June 2011, an Ethiopian government the Ethiopian government labeled Ginbot7 as a terrorist group, along with the Ogaden National Liberation Front and the Oromo Liberation Front under the country's anti-terrorism proclamation. Ethiopia, by the way, is one of the NSA's approved SIGINT partners. As you can see on this chart, taken from the Snowden documents published in Glenn Greenwald's book, No Place to Hide, Ethiopia received $450,000 from the NSA to build out its surveillance capabilities, including those targeting terrorists, which is what the Ethiopian government calls political dissidents. Citizen Lab reports have found both FinFisher and hacking team control and command and control servers operating in Ethiopia. Given how relatively inexpensive these products are, 450K goes a long way towards covering those costs. Three months later, I was put in touch with a person in Washington, D.C., who provided technical support for Ginbot 7, known by the pseudonym Kidane. I explained the researcher's findings, described FinFisher's capabilities, 
and he allowed an expert to examine his computer for malware. Forensic analysis reva revealed that his computer had been infected with Finn Fisher's surveillance tool, FinSpy. It had been uninstalled shortly after uh, the Citizen Lab's publication of the news that uh, Ethiopia was hosting a command and control server. Uh, but the uninstallation process had left traces which enabled us to know some of the soft, uh, that some of the software had recorded and possibly exfiltrated back to the Ethiopian government, all kinds of data including Skype calls and Google searches. Further analysis traced the infection back to an infected Word document which had been sent by agents of the Ethiopian government and forwarded to Kidane. Because the spying happened in the United States, in fact, Mr. Kadane's laptop never left the US, EFF is representing him in a lawsuit against the Ethiopian government. We are suing the Ethiopian government for violating the US wiretapping act and state privacy law. This case is important because it demonstrates that state-sponsored malware infections can and indeed are occurring in the US against US citizens. It seeks to demonstrate that warrantless wiretapping is illegal and can be the basis of a lawsuit in the United States regardless of who engages in it. Meanwhile, in the UK, British privacy watchdogs, Privacy International, um, used the findings on Mr. Kidani's computers as well as Citizen Lab's extensive research into the use of UK-based Gamma International surveillance software to facilitate human rights violations to put pressure on Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to investigate these exports. We expect EFF's lawsuit and PI's legal action will take a long time to work their way through the courts. The fight against government, governments that abuse human rights through targeted surveillance and companies that sell to them facilitating this abuse is a long one, but it would not be possible at all without public research directly linking human rights abuses to the surveillance software. So, what can you do? What do I want you to do with your next year of research? If you find malware targeting vulnerable groups, publish your research. Ideally, it should be written in a way that can be understood by journalists and activists and ordinary readers who can turn it into advice for targets and fodder for policy decisions. And if you can't do that, partner with a journalist or activist for an affected community. I am not a reverser, but I have spent the last two or three years working with reversers, turning these kinds of reports into things that are readable by journalists and activists. If you're concerned about the possibility of the legal, of legal implications of publishing your research, contact me at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We have an entire floor of lawyers who have been defending the rights of security researchers to publish this work for decades. If you are located outside of the United States, and I imagine some of you are, in fact we are right now, and you are concerned about legal action outside of the US, I can make a referral. And finally, I have a bunch of people that I would like to thank, uh, including John Adams, Morgan Marquis Boire, Bill Martzak, Cooper Quinton, Cindy Cohen, Nate Cardozo, Citizen Lab, and Privacy International. You are all heroes and rock stars. Thank you very much.